We're going to be talking about sample spaces and events to get us going. In this course, we're dealing mostly with random experiments. The name might sound mysterious, and then there's like this random bit in it, but all we're really saying is that we're looking at measurements. Measurements of speed, measurements of weight, measurements of the number of phone calls in a time period, or the duration of phone calls in a time period. For any experiment that we run, the sample space is going to be the set of all the possible outcomes. And often here what we mean is the reasonable set of possible outcomes. There is a chance that I might spontaneously combust as I'm giving these lectures. It is not impossible, it is not inconceivable, but it's not going to happen. So well, effectively, this would be an outcome that we, we would remove from the set of possible outcomes. The set of outcomes, the sample space, we'll call it usually S. Now, depending on the type of measurements we have, the sample space can be discrete or continuous. In practice, most sample spaces are discrete. Like when you're looking at the measurement, of someone's height, you might say, well, there's a continuum of potential values, but if you go down at the subatomic level, the Planck's length h makes it so that there's only a finite number of heights that somebody could have. But it will make more sense, even though we're dealing with a discrete sample space to model it, to treat it as though it was continuous. And that's going to allow us to use calculus instead of just discrete mathematics. An event for us is going to be a collection of outcomes from the sample space. And we'll denote the events using uppercase Roman letters. A, B, E1, E2, and so forth. Well, let's look at some examples of sample spaces. Let's say your experiment is to toss a fair coin, a regular coin. The sample space contains two possible outcomes, head or tail. The reality, of course, is that there are other possible outcomes. You can imagine a setup where you flip the coin and then it falls on its edge, it lands on its edge. That would be neither head nor tail. Or you can imagine an, app, an experiment where you toss a fair coin and as it's flipping in the air, it's about to come down, a seagull sweeps in and takes it in its mouth and disappears with it and we'll never be able to tell whether it would have been head or tail. So these are possible outcomes, but they're not really possible outcomes. Right? So we're gonna get rid of these ridiculous types of outcomes, even though they are technically speaking possible. And we'll only deal with the things that we are likely to see, at least the plausible outcomes. Here's another experiment. You might roll a die. The discrete sample space in this case would be the possible results of the experiment. And if you roll a die, you can get one, two, three, four, five, six, assuming you're working with a regular six-sided die. I know some of you might have experience work, uh, playing games where you have um, dice that don't necessarily have only six sides. You would replace the set of outcomes based on the kind of die you're working with. Here's examples of events. You might be looking for the event where you roll an even number. And this would be a collection of outcomes, all the out outcomes that are even. 2, 4, and 6. So your event here contains three outcomes. You might also be looking at um, the event where you roll a prime number. Well, the set of outcome is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's again only three of them that are prime, but it's not the same three. It would be the numbers 2, 3, and 5. 
Here is another experiment. You're going to measure the weight in grams of some chemical sample. The sample space here is continuous, or at least it makes sense to represent it as a continuous sample space. All possible values between zero and infinity, excluding zero and infinity. If you have a sample of some chemical substance, well, it has a weight. It can't be zero grams. And it cannot be infinite because a sample requires you to have a finite box or a finite quantity of matter, so the mass cannot be infinite. So we'll say that the sample space is the half line zero to infinity or the positive half line, even though in practice it's probably not going all the way to infinity. Right? If you believe, as a lot of scientists do, that the universe is finite, there isn't an infinite amount of things in it. In particular, the weight of anything has to be finite and it has to be bounded by some, yeah, granted, very large positive number, but it would still be bounded above by some number. And as we've spoken before, there might be a thing, uh, a thing such as the smallest possible weight you can have, which is non-zero, a blank weight you want and so it isn't true that any potential real number could be the result of your experiment but we will still treat the sample space as continuous so if you had events such as the sample weighs less than 1.5 grams then you're looking at the interval between 0 and 1.5 excluding both of them if you're looking at a sample which exceeds 5 grams, that event would be all the possible outcomes above 5 grams, excluding 5 grams. If you take any two events, A and B and S, any two subsets of A and B, and often we'll write those here like this. So here's your A, here's your B, here's your S. And you'll recognize your friend, the Venn diagram. Then the union of these events will be all of the outcomes from S, which are either in A or B. What you would get. The intersection of events, I'm not going to draw the box S anymore, the intersection of events would be anything which is in both. And the complement of an event would be everything which is not in the event here. It is useful to draw the box of outcomes here. If this is my event A, the complement of A would be everything which is not in A. There's many ways to denote it. Sometimes you'll see A bar or minus A or A, C. They all represent the same thing. The outcomes in S that are not in A. If it turns out that two events have no outcomes in common. If they are mutually exclusive, well, what this is saying is that the intersection is empty. So if two events have no intersection here, we say that they're mutually exclusive. And by definition, because A and its complement cannot have an intersection, right? A complement is everything which is not an A, so there cannot be anything in A complement which is also an A. You are working with two mutually exclusive events. One of them can occur, or the other one can occur, but it's impossible for both of these to occur.
important here to remember the property or the definition of mutually exclusive event, this bit here. Later on, we'll talk about independent events. We'll see it has a different definition and some people often mistake or sometimes mistake these definitions. Here's an example for us. Let's say you roll a die. Our first event will be A, that you roll a prime number. We've seen that there's three such outcomes that correspond to that event, two, three, five. And the second event, B, might be that you, uh, you roll a multiple of three and there's only two such events. So let's try to draw a little box here to give us an idea as to what would be happening. Here's my space of outcomes, my sample space. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me write them in. One. And then you look at event A. Event A would be the numbers two, three, and five. This is what event A looks like. And event B is the set of multiples of three, so three and six. Now, if I was smart, I'd try to come up with a different color here. Let's see. Event B, and I said three and six. Uh, we see that these events are not mutually exclusive because their intersection is not empty, right? A intersection B would be three. So what we have is that they cannot be mutually exclusive. Their union, well, that's the list of everything which isn't either A or B, so two, three, five, six. And the complement of A is everything which is not in A, which is to say six together with four and one. Because everything else is in A. But when you're working with discrete outcomes, discrete sample spaces, this isn't too complicated. Here's another example. Let's say you take 100 plastic samples and you analyze them for scratch and shock resistance. And you'll classify shock resistance as high or low and scratch resistance as high or low. So you have 100 samples, 100 specimens that you're testing, 100 results, 100 measurements. We'll say that A is the event that the sample is high shock resistance. That would be this one here, 41 of your specimens at high shock resistance, and B will be the event that it has high scratch resistance. So there's 44 in total that have high scratch resistance. Now, this is based on these measurements. If you were to take a different hundred samples, a hundred different hundred specimens, and you test them, you might get a different breakdown of how they work. But in this example, 40 of them were both uh, highly resistant to shock and scratch. And then I had these five other objects, which were uh, a combination of high and low, depending on uh, what thing you were testing for. And the intersection of events A and B contains only 40 observations.